part two of part two of the Revenge. philosophy of, of minds, brains, and machines. Uh, so let me introduce our second speaker, uh, Dr. Mark Johansson, uh, an assistant professor with the philosophy department right across town at Creighton. So we appreciate him driving all the way here. Uh, he also works in mind and metaphysics. He's recently published in the Philosophy Compass, the Australian Journal of Philosophy, Philosopher's Imprint. And so will you all please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark uh, Johansson who talks about having disposition in the uh, First of all, thank you for having me. It is a pleasure to, to be here. I'm always excited to come across town. Um, really, if you're within five minutes of my house, I will absolutely come give a talk. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, so yeah, so thanks Raphael for that awesome first talk. I will, I will try and live up to it. I have no cool chimp experiments, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll see what I can do. Um, so two quick preliminaries. Uh, one, I don't have any real slides, but I do have a handout, which is pretty dense. So hopefully everyone has a copy of that. The handout should give you uh, a rundown of uh, the definitions and all the formalism that will be sort of like Years and uh, thingamabobbers that we'll use to sort of like make the talk run. Um, if like ifs with multiple f's is intimidating or whatever, don't sweat it too much. We'll make sure that everything is pretty clear. Um, secondly, um, it's, I want to just flag. So this is going to be a talk in I think uh, philosophy of mind adjacent metaphysics. So. Um, for those of you who are uh, either maybe a little new philosophy or coming from other parts of the cognitive sciences, um, I just want to assure you to please don't be scared by the quote at the top of the handout referencing occult powers. Um, <laughs> this is not going to be the sort of metaphysics where we talk about like astral projection or anything like that. So um, having said that, what is the talk actually going to be about? Uh, it's going to be about dispositions, uh, characteristics like Fragility, solubility, but also for people say like dispositions, certain acts to act in certain ways or behave or to think in certain ways. Um, dispositions have been uh, a topic of interest to philosophers for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is just that as a class of properties, dispositions are a little bit funny. Um, on the one hand, uh, I think dispositions seem like very real characteristics of that thing. Right? When we have a, have a box and you label it as being fragile or flammable, it seems like you're indicating something that's a very real characteristic of the things in the box. Right? If you discover that the person who's going to be picking you up from the airport is forgetful, you care about that. Yeah. Like That's important. Um, at the same time, uh, dispositions are, I mean, as, as Nelson Goodman sort of famously remarks, kind of the Ethereal. They're sort of hard to pin down, uh, in particular because dispositions are what you know philosophers would call a modal property. They concern uh, possibility and potentiality, uh, and possibility and potentiality are just sort of tricky things to actually make concrete and precise. I mean, to set dispositions aside for a second, like. When I say it's true that there's a lectern in the front of this room, I can just really, I have no doubt about why that's true. I can point to the thing that makes it true. If this wasn't here and I said, well, there was potentially a lectern in this room, or there was possibly a lectern in this room, it's a little bit harder to say, well, why is that true? There's nothing to be able to point at. Um, and with dispositions, you get a particularly strange kind of modality, or at least it's distinctive. Right. Um, to be disposed concerns what could possibly happen in some way. Um, but notice, to be disposed is not to guarantee that anything is going to happen. So, for example, fragility is like a disposition that concerns breaking in some way. But th many things that are fragile never break. So fragility doesn't necessitate breaking. Um, but it's also not true that fragility just means that something that's fragile just might possibly break. Right. Lots of things that break are not fragile. So the disposition of fragility, it's not a guarantee of breaking, but it's not really possible breaking. It falls somewhere in between this murky middle ground. And, and notice it's also like a gradable characteristic. It comes in degrees. Things can be more or less fragile than other things. 
So the goal then, um, at least that for, for many, many people is, uh, for many metaphysicians at least, is this is a thought that we, we want to try to make this sort of concrete in some way and make sense of dispositions. So that's broadly speaking what I want to do here today, or at least to try. So um, in broad strokes, like the outline of what I want to do here is I want to raise a problem for uh, really any kind of theory of disposition descriptions. I want to give you another theory that I think solves the problem and then trying to show you how it solves the problem. Uh, time permitting, I'd be glad to actually I'll try to frame a potential objection to what I'm doing and respond to it, but uh, we'll see if we get there. If not, I'm sure it'll come back to you at night. So, um, diving in. So the, the, the problem I really want to talk to you today is about the, the problem of masking. So it's, it's sort of a, it seems straightforwardly enough that dispositions are often masked in the following sense, right? Uh, a plant may have the disposition to dry out in the sun and you can mask that by watering it. Uh, a fragile wine glass, um, right? It might be disposed to break, um, but you can mask that by say like packing it up very carefully when you're moving. Um, so for similarly, uh, we think of people having psychological dispositions that can also get masked in various ways. Actually put that on hold for just one second. Um, the examples that I just ran through, like the, uh, the wine glass that's masked or the plant that has disposition to dry out is masked. Notice the masks are all extrinsic to the thing that has the disposition, right? The thing that is doing the masking is something in the object's environment. And most paradigmatic cases of masking are like that. Um, what's more controversial than whether a mask can be in the environment, but whether a thing can have a disposition, but also have a characteristic that masks its disposition. In other words, whether the mask can be actually intrinsic to the disposition bearer. Now, I think that there's uh, some, some straightforward reasons to think that that actually could be the case. Um, so for example, um, suppose that, Suppose that Ned is disposed to ramble when he's nervous. But thankfully, Ned has a. Uh, sorry, sorry. I, I'm just it's kind of funny to ask at this point, but do you think you could take off your mask just to what, when you're sort of far up ahead of us, just to for doing? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Is it, it, is, there, is it, am I not projecting well enough? Are we, you can just boom and bellow, yeah. I'll boom and bellow. I will, I will up my voice. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. So, okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Do I need to back up or anything? Are we okay? All right. Okay. We'll project. I'll project a little bit more. Hopefully, we can do this. Okay. So, Ned. So, let's say suppose Ned is disposed to ramble when he's nervous. But, Ned's not happy about this. Ned doesn't want this as a characteristic. So Ned has resolved to stop doing this. And with great effort, he's tried and been successful. But this is the kind of thing that Ned has to consciously work at. Well, what should we say about this? Well, I think a natural way to think about this case is as a case of intrinsic masking, right? Ned has a disposition to ramble when he's nervous. That disposition is masked by his resolution, his act of will, not to do so. Now, I think that's relatively intuitive. I hope you're on board with me. It's worth acknowledging that there's other things we could say about Ned in this case. We might say that as soon as Ned has this resolution or exerts his will, that his disposition to ramble when he's nervous just disappears. Uh, that seems a little bit unsatisfying for a couple of reasons. If, for example, Ned's will breaks, well, we have to say there, instead of losing the mask of a disposition when his will breaks, instead what happens is he now all of a sudden gains a new disposition. I think it makes much more sense to say that instead of when the mask, when the, the will goes, the mask goes, not that a disposition appears. Secondly, um, notice that there's, a, I think, a sense that where 
described in this case is a case where Ned loses the disposition. Um, has trouble just kind of capturing the sort of the phenomenological reality of Ned's situation here. Ned really has to try. He has to strain. It feels like his effort is resisting something. If there's no disposition there to resist, then it's kind of hard to make sense about how we could really do justice to what's going on in, in Ned's, Ned's life psychologically. Um, so that seems like a, a poor option. There is a slightly more evolved, sort of fancier version of that option we could do. We could say this. Maybe what happens is that Ned has the following disposition. The disposition to ramble when he's nervous, but not resolved against it. All right, so now we have a fancier kind of cue for the rambling. Notice you could do that, but if you want to say that, we still don't actually get the tension that, that, uh, that Ned's experiencing, right? Ned is no longer actually resisting the disposition. It's just he has a disposition that actually just isn't being triggered. The stimulus isn't occurring because the, the resolve is there, right? So that option also seems like a bad. So I think that there's just in the process of just trying to account for cases and do justice to a certain amount of psychological reality. I think there's a, there's a reason to think that there can be intrinsic masking. But that's not really the only reason, or necessarily even the best reason to think that there could be intrinsic masking. Um, I think one of the really important reasons to, to suspect that there is intrinsic masking uh, has a lot to do with really another reason that philosophers have been interested in dispositions. Namely, dispositions are explanatorily really powerful. They're an important part of sort of like the philosophical toolkit. We appeal to dispositions in order to explain other phenomena, especially in the philosophy of mind. And it turns out um, that Having intrinsic masking in our bag of, of tools uh, can really help a dispositional theory uh, across a lot of domains. I mean, so for example, uh, intrinsic masks have been invoked to say, support dispositional theories of desire, uh, of rule following, uh, very importantly, a uh, defense of sort of compatibilist approaches to free will and the ability to do otherwise. Uh, you might also think it's important to defend against uh, certain critiques of, say, character traits or defend various counts of perception. So just to see how, how this goes, I mean, um, imagine, for example, I think I'm guessing a lot of people in this room are familiar with, say, like Putnam's critique of behaviorism involving, say, like the ex-worlders and the super Spartans, right? The idea is you have these people who Putnam says, look, they're in pain. And according to the behaviors, that means they're disposed to certain kinds of pain behavior. But right? The super Spartan is just by birth so resolved that they will show no pain whatsoever. And, and so Putnam takes a say, look, well, they don't have the disposition to engage in pain behavior. Alternatively, they do have that disposition. It's just masked, right? It's masked by some other quality that they have. Or again, uh, take something like this. Uh, Armstrong's dispositional account of perceptual experience. So, for example, Armstrong claims, uh, uh, among other things, right, that in order to perceive that P, you must be disposed to believe that P. And that kind of view is going to run into a whole bunch of trouble as soon as we get, case, get run into cases, say, like of visual illusions. Like, so if you take like the Mueller liar lines uh, that Raphael had up on the, the screen before. Um, Sure, maybe the first time you see Mueller liar lines, you might say, yeah, I believe that one line is shorter than the other. But for I mean, most of us who have seen the Mueller liar illusions so many times, we look at it and we go, yeah, those are Mueller liar lines. I don't actually believe that one line is shorter than the other. But it looks that way. All right, so you can perceive that one line is shorter, even though you're not, it seems like you're not gonna form that belief. You reliably won't form the belief. So could you be still disposed to form the belief? Sure, if that disposition is masked and what's masking it, presumably another belief. Or again, if you just want another example of how this could play out, um, think about sort of like the sort of uh, 
critiques of character traits that you get from, say, situationists in psychology. Mm. Think about like, the Milgram experiments. Does the Milgram experiment show that people lack compassion? Maybe alternative, right? Compassion is essentially a character trait, a stable disposition. Well, here's an alternative again. People actually have competing dispositions here, right? So maybe what we have here is that people do have a disposition towards compassion, but they also have a stronger disposition towards obedience of authority figures, right? And we could have the case where one disposition masks the other, the competing dispositions. These are the sorts of moves that someone can make if they want to recognize intrinsically masked dispositions. So while intrinsic masking is controversial, I think there's a really good case to be made for it, particularly when we look at phenomena in the philosophy of mind and sort of related areas. So here's the thing, intrinsic masking is actually kind of a problem. In particular, um, it makes a lot of trouble for the sort of standard traditional approach that philosophers have taken to understanding dispositions, which has been in terms of subjunctive conditionals. Um, so if you're on the, the slide, the, the handout, by the way, we are now in point two. Here's, here's the idea. So um, the traditional approach to disposition descriptions has been to do the following thing. First, we start with some disposition, ordinary language dispositional predicates, like fragility. We translate those sorts of ordinary language predicates into a kind of standard form. So fragility is the disposition to break when struck. More generally, we then individuate these standard form dispositions in terms of their manifestation and stimulus character, uh, conditions. So we have we're talking about dispositions in terms of to be disposed to manifest when stimulus conditions are met. Now, look, we have a very straightforward way of taking these manifestation and stimulus conditions and plugging them into a conditional, right? So um, we have then is a the B sort of like oldest traditional account, like the simple conditional account says this. An object O has a disposition to manifest M when in stimulus condition C if O would M if C, right? So something is fragile just in case it would break if it was impacted. Ned is disposed to ramble when he's nervous if Ned would ramble if he was nervous. Now, for what it's worth, the simple conditional account is, is almost certainly wrong. Nobody actually endorses it in that form without adding some bells and whistles to it. Uh, for the simple reason that the simple conditional account just doesn't deal with any kind of masking whatsoever, right? Your uh, granny's fragile vase, right? Might have a property that will break if it's impacted. But when you're moving, you pack it up and cover it up in packing material and bubble wrap. So it's like you could actually like jolt it pretty good and it won't break. So the simple conditional account fails, straightforward. But we can add bells and whistles. So for the conditional accounts, those bells and whistles have generally taken two sorts of forms. There's generally two strategies here. So the first strategy is the strategy that uh, David Manley and Ryan Wasserman have described as the strategy of getting specific. The getting specific strategy tries to do the following things. It tries to say, look, what we need to do is we still want to look at conditionals, but we want to carve out our, we want to look for testing conditions, conditions where we should expect the disposition to manifest that are going to be free of any kinds of masks or other sorts of interferences. So the thought is something like this. And instead of saying an object O has a disposition to manifest M and C, just in case it would M if C, we say something like this. Um, something is dis uh, disposed to M when C, just in case it would M if C, ceteris paribus, 
or under ordinary conditions or normal conditions or ideal conditions, or maybe we do something a little bit fancier and we actually take on a disposition by disposition basis, some extremely fancy, carefully tailored st uh, stimulus conditions and associate that with an individual dispositional predicate. Or maybe we go even further, we just stop an entirely novel semantics for conditionals that'll give us the same results. Right? These are all moves that people have made. That's one kind of option. Another option uh, is to take the approach that uh, Manley and Wasserman did not, but should have called the strategy of getting prolific. The getting prolific strategy does the following things. What we're not going to do is try and come up with one neatly tailored conditional such that whenever there is a mask or some other kind of interference, that the antecedent condition isn't satisfied. What we're going to do is we're just going to brute force things. What we're going to do is just have like a gigantic list of conditionals that just say something like this. Well, something is disposed to break when struck, just in case if would break if struck under one condition where the environment is one way. And then we have another one. If it would break when struck and the condition was a different way. And we keep very like sort of iterating through different sorts of environments in which something could be struck. And look, would it break? And we ask ourselves, like, well, in what proportion of these striking cases does it break? And the mark of fragility then is that enough of those conditionals come out true. Right? So we look for a sufficiently large proportion of cases. And this is what we get here with Manley and Wasserman, sometimes called a proportionality account. It says that an object O has a disposition to manifest M when in stimulus condition C, if and only if O would M in a suitable proportion of C cases, where these C cases are just environments or conditions where the stimulus condition obtains. Okay. So that's a mouthful. That's a bunch of ifs and conditions. How are we doing with that? Is, is, uh, are we tracking so far? Okay, awesome. So look, uh, let's go ahead. I'm just going to go ahead and grant and say like these, this, the getting specific strategy and the getting prolific strategy. Um, let's say that works for extrinsic masks. So for example, let's just grant that say, you know what, um, when we have our, our wine glasses or granny's vase that's fragile, um, you know what, under normal or ideal conditions, there's not any bubble wrap around those, right? They would break if struck. And that, in fact, in enough of those C cases, they would also break with struck. There's enough environments, possible environments that the vase could be in where if it was struck, it would break. Both of these moves really fall down in the case of intrinsic masking. So for example, think about net. Ned is disposed, let's say, to ramble when he's nervous. Okay. Well, he's not going to ramble when he's nervous as long as his resolve holds. Okay. Well, look, it seems like Ned and his resolve could hold under ideal conditions, under ordinary conditions, ceteris paribus, and a great and a huge list of possible environments. Because what we're doing here is essentially just like taking Ned and putting him in those different environments. And the resolve is still there, right? We don't have to think that Ned's resolve is somehow like this fluky characteristic that might come and go. We can say that Ned is actually committed to this. This is his resolve and he's gonna fight that disposition to ramble like tooth and nail as long as it takes. And so it looks, it looks plausibly like these sorts of conditional accounts just aren't going to cut it, right? They're not going to be able to recognize that Ned is in fact disposed to ramble when he's nervous. And in general, to capture like lots of cases of intrinsic masking. So for, for what it's worth, a little caveat here. I don't want to suggest that no conditional account whatsoever could be made to work. I think you could shape a conditional account that does account for intrinsic masking. I just think what this, what we do get from these views is one, 
the most prominent accounts in the literature don't handle intrinsic masking very well. And that this conditional approach just isn't especially well suited to capture the ideas and dispositions to be intrinsically masked. So what do we do? Well, there is an alternative. Intrinsic masking actually fits very well in a very with it, a different conception of dispositions. So this debate about intrinsic masking um, actually has, has tracked along the lines of a debate about some pretty foundational issues in metaphysics and the metaphysics of science and modality. Because here's a really elegant way of uh, making sense of intrinsically mass dispositions. You can make sense of them if you appeal to powers. What's a power? Uh, a power, as you can understand, is a kind of property that is essentially dispositional or dispositional in nature. Right? That what, what, part of what defines this property and makes it what it, it is, is it's sort of like causal or lawful or dispositional relationships to other properties, right? Such that anything that has such a power is disposed um, towards certain other properties, towards certain outcomes. So uh, for example, uh, you might taste something like, uh, something like mass and conceive it as a power. Right. To say that mass is a power is to say that what makes mass mass is that it disposes things to not accelerate. It disposes things to be attracted to other objects with mass. There's a thought is like anything that has mass has those corresponding dispositions. Now, where does this come in? The powers theorist wants to make the following move. At least some fundamental properties are powers, something like mass or charge or the like. Now, notice that once you've got this, this, this is moved, made, right? You've made dispositions just part of the metaphysical bedrock, right? We're not explaining how mass has this disposition, right? Rather, we're using mass's disposition to explain other things. But if we've done that, um, notice. Do we dispose then to be attracted towards other massive objects or to resist acceleration? We don't require the truth of any conditional. Something could have that disposition and never actually do those things because to have that disposition, it just has to have the property. That's it. We're not relying on its behavior, its actual or counterfactual behavior. So we can, we can do that. And, and one particular way we can do that really robustly it is to make the sort of move uh, that's been sort of popularized uh, by work from Stephen Mumford and Randy Lil Anjum, and think uh, and have the following view: um, all properties are powers, not just the fundamental ones, not just some fundamental ones. A power theorist could stop there, right? They just have to say some fundamental properties are powers. What Mumford and Anjum want to do is say, no, no, all properties are powers. And they then want to model that kind of dispositional relationship basically in terms of, of vectors. Think of like component force vectors from physics. So the thought is that Granny's vase is disposed to break when struck. Granny's vase has a kind of property that has a vector pointing towards breaking. When you wrap it up in bubble wrap, the bubble wrap is masking that by exerting an opposing vector against breaking. Why doesn't it break when it's struck? Well, Mumford and Ange will say, because the masking vector outweighs right, the fragility vector, right? You do the vector uh, addition and you get that it's not really pointing us in the direction of breaking strong enough to break. So, if we want to account for intrinsic masking, in all of the cases where we have some sort of theoretical utility for appealing to intrinsic masking, one thing we could do is just side with Mumford and Anjum. But 
I got to confess, I'm not comfortable with that. Um, I have some human intuitions about the nature of modality and properties, and I don't want to bake modality into the metaphysical groundwork. Ideally, I would like to explain modalities and dispositions rather than just start with it as a given. So Mumford and Andrum's move is a non-starter for me. So what could we do? Well, here's, here's my proposal. We're moving on the second page of the handout. Oh, you're not. I take that back. We're almost there. Here's my plan. Uh, I think you can capture what's really valuable about Mumford and Adams' picture without saying anything about built in powers. And so I want to sketch a way of how to do that. Here's the idea. What Mumford and Andrew want to say is that individual properties have a kind of dispositional nature, dispositional character, where to have that disposition, you just got to have the corresponding property. You know, it has, in other words, it has kind of influence. That property is, is, a, is a kind of basic push and pull. I think events actually work this way. An ordinary event exerts a kind of basic fundamental push and pull. How so? Well, here's a little, a little bit of intuition mongering, if you'll permit me. Uh, suppose that I've got like, uh, we have like a vial of water and I've got a drop of blue dye and Joe has a drop of yellow dye. We both add them to the vial at the same time. Boom, the water turns green. Okay, let's suppose that in the difference. Suppose that I had the blue dye and Joe had some red dye. Drop them in there, it turns purple. Suppose that I have the blue dye and I don't actually give Joe a chance to add anything, the water turns blue. Simple, fair enough, nothing fancy going on here. A simple reminder that causal relationships are extrinsic. What my action causes depends on what's going on in the environment, right? If what my adding blue dye to the water causes depends on what Joe does or doesn't do. Here's the intuition mantra. I have the sense that while what my action causes might depend on what's going on in the environment, there's a sense in which what I do still exerts an influence on the world that does not depend on these extra environmental factors. That in some ways, just by adding a drop of blue dye to the water, I am influencing what comes next. And it's the same influence in all three of those cases. Notice, whatever kind of influence that is, that's not causation, right? Because the, the effect varies, right? What my action causes varies. Its influence does not. So what is that influence? Here's my proposal. Um, that influence is what I'll call a contribution or a causal contribution. What my action does, what any event does, just by occurring, is it opposes a constraint on what the future can be like. A constraint in just the following very straightforward sense. Assume the laws are determinist, uh, deterministic. The state of the world at one time fixes the state of the world at all other times. Pretty common assumption in the dispositions and causation literature. If that's the case, any future state of the world, any future sequence of states of the world have to be consistent with the laws and the fact that I added that drop of blue dye to the water. By adding the drop of blue dye to the water, I constrain what the future can be like. I limit what future states of affairs can obtain. For the record, not the big way, in a very little way. But you know, it's just one event, so it's not going to do too much all by itself. So how, how can we account for that? Here's how I think we can account for that. We can account for that and basically saying a contribution is a set of nomically possible worlds. Specifically, it's a set of nomically possible worlds where an event occurs. 
if a future state of affairs is going to obtain, it must obtain in one of the worlds in an event's contribution, right? So if a state of the world is going to obtain in the wake of my adding blue dye to the water, there must be some world in the contribution where that state of the world obtains following my adding the blue dye to the water. So to make this all work, we have to get a little bit more fine-grained than that. Um, so what is going to be an event on this view? Every you know, metaphysician and their grandmother has a theory of events. Um, here's the one I'm going to work with. It's a broadly Lewisian, broadly Kimian. It's just this. An, an event is an object having a property of time. So um, that's what an event is. That event occurs in every world in an event's contribution. You notice because if we're defining events this way, we have to be careful to sort of individuate the influence that an event has in virtue of its constitutive property versus all the other properties of the object that has, right? So for example, if we put like, uh, I don't know, a, an apple on a scale, right? The apple is red and it has a certain mass, we're going to want to talk about the contribution, say, associated with a, one property and not the other. So in, in order to do that, a little bit of technicality here, um, for the purposes of contributions, I am not going to take the, uh, the constitutive object of that event to be essential to it. So what that means is, if we have, say, following event, putting, say, a 200 gram apple on a scale at the grocery store at 1 p.m. Doing so makes a contribution. What is that contribution? It's the set of nautically possible worlds where, if, if we're concerned with the contribution of the mass, it's the set of nautically possible worlds in which something on the scale at 1 p.m. weighs 200 grams. Maybe it's an apple, maybe it's something else, who knows? But that's the idea. And for the record, because it's going to be relevant later on, let's just say that the other objects in different possible worlds um, that sort of participate in that event in different worlds, uh, let's call those the Apple's event counterparts. Let's flag that for later. So in other words, here's the idea. Here's what uh, an event does all by itself. It constrains future possibilities. Now, that's similar to what Mumford and Andrum said about dispositions in, in one respect, in that it's a thing that has a kind of influence all to itself, regardless of what other characteristics a thing might have or what's going on in the environment. Uh, but contributions, at least at first blush, don't really look a lot like dispositions. Dispositions are aimed generally at particular outcomes, not whole states of the world, right? Um, <laughs> Granny's vase has the disposition to break when struck. That's an object undergoing some kind of a change, right? It's not the whole state of the world, right? Ned is disposed to ramble, not the whole state of the world. And moreover, it, it seems like dispositions, again, right, promote those outcomes in a variable way, whereas the contributions, as I've described them, it takes world states and says, look, you either could obtain or you could not obtain. It treats things as possible, or ruled out. So we don't really have anything quite disposition like yet. But we can change that in the following way. I propose we just borrow a move from uh, Manley and Wasserman and start talking about proportions. So here's the thought. Um, the things that go on in an event's contribution across different worlds are gonna depend on the kinds of lawful relationships they have to the contributing event. So for example, suppose that like uh, a rock impacts a window at the same time as a car backfires, right? The proportion is, so take two, we have two contributions, one involving a set of worlds where the rock impacts the window and another set of worlds in which the car backfires. The proportion of worlds in which the window breaks in the rocks contribution is going to be very different than the portion of worlds where the window breaks in the car backfiring. That's my claim. 
for the record. It's a little bit of an assumption. If you want to push me on this in Q&A, it's totally reasonable. But that's that's the idea in any case, right? So we have now, what do we get, right? We have an event in virtue of making a contribution. You can look at events in their contribution, say they occur in different proportions. So we can take that say that event promotes various outcomes in their contribution to different degrees. The contribution of the rock hitting the window promotes the window breaking in a way that the car backfiring does not promote the window break. Now we've got something that looks kind of dispositional, right? That an event is promoting certain outcomes to different degrees. So how do we turn this then into an actual account of dispositions, right? We've got events having a kind of disposition-like influence, but uh, when we talk about dispositions, we want to attribute them to objects, not events. But this is actually pretty simple. Um, for example, think of a parallel here with causation. Uh, standard accounts of causation take events to be the primary causal relata. The things that does do this, the causing and the effects are events, happenings. So we can say, look, the baseball hitting the window caused the window to break. We can also say that the baseball broke the window. Right? And that's a causal claim. The claim that an object caused some effect. And there's a straightforward way to do this, right? The baseball breaks the window because the baseball part participates in the event of the impacting. So we can say that events, just like with causation, so if an event causes some effect, an object that participates in that event can cause some effect. Let's just say that just as an event makes a contribution, an object that participates in that event makes the corresponding contribution. And because we've understood events as objects having properties at times and places, but we can do that pretty simply, right? So then we just want to say, right, that an object O, for the record, and here's going to be, um, oh, let me back up just a second. We can now at least we get the move rather than uh, an object is now exerting in virtue of having a property, a disposition like influence. We're real close then to an account of dispositions. And the idea is just this, that an object then has a disposition when it has a property in virtue of which it makes a contribution that sort of promotes the kind of behavior we associate with that disposition. Right. So um, for Ned to be disposed to say ramble when he's nervous, we need to suppose that Ned has some property such that Ned makes a contribution that promotes Ned's rambling when he's nervous. That Granny's fragile vase has a has a property, like say being made of thin porcelain, such that it makes a contribution that promotes breaking when being struck. Or more generally, if you want the kind of formal version, you can find it on the handout. Um, but the claim is just this. An object O has a disposition to M, let's see, if and only if it has an intrinsic property P, and also the event constituted by O's having P makes a contribution in which O's event counterparts um, M in a suitable proportion of worlds where C. So for example, right, Nan has some property, in which I property, he makes a contribution. And within that contribution, a suitable proportion of Ned's counterparts, things that have whatever property it is that's grounding this disposition, ramble when they're nervous. And there you go. So notice what we get here. We get this account that looks like it captures a sense in which things can have properties that behave in ways that sure look like dispositions. They exert an influence that is modal and also variably modal, the proportion of worlds in which we find this sort of pattern of activity associated with the disposition can vary. So things can be more or less fragile. And once we have this, um, I think we can make straightforward work of accounting for intrinsic masking. So moving on to part four of the handout, um, 
here's here's the idea. Um, what you get in a case of intrinsic masking. Pause. Actually, we're part five. Um, we're going to account for uh, intrinsic masking. Here's all we have to do. What we want to say is that in a case of intrinsic masking, something has two properties one property that bestows on it the disposition, and another property that masks it. Right? So Ned has this property such that he makes a contribution that promotes him rambling when he's nervous. And he has another property which provides like his, his resolution, his, his willing not to do that, that masks it, that prevents that disposition from manifesting. In fact, Ned, if he's really, really resolute, may never ramble again. It may be false that he would ramble when nervous under any kind of conditions you like. Setters parents, right? Deal of pressure. And the vast majority of environmental changes, Ned still won't ramble when he's nervous, but he is still disposed to ramble when nervous because he has this property that promotes a kind of behavior. It's just masked. I think we're running a little bit uh, long on time. So tell you what, um, I think there's a little bit more you can say here. In fact, I think you can actually use now this kind of just to gesture broadly. Notice what we can also do here is, is start to talk now about how dispositions may actually oppose one another. Okay. Um, very briefly, the idea is this. Contributions, for the record, could interact. Right? Say the joint contribution of, say, an event A and event B, so the set of nonically possible worlds where they both occur, is effectively the intersection of their two individual contributions. Right. And notice characteristics that might occur in a suitable proportion of the contributions of one event don't necessarily occur in that same proportion of the intersection of that contribution with another. Right. And so we can make sense of this idea that various, and I'm take, take it on my word, we can make sense of this idea that dispositions are now opposing one another, that one dispositions can underwrite and weaken and resist another one. Right. Specifically, if the proportion of worlds, say, where Ned rambles when he's nervous in one contribution, or rather, in say, the intersection of two contributions is less than it is, say, in just the contribution that bestows that disposition. The essential is that other event is serving as a kind of resistance to that disposition. One disposition resists another, which for the record notes, you do not get to say that when you start cashing this out totally in terms of counterfactual conditional or subjunctive conditionals generally. Okay. So look, I think there, there's more to say. There's plenty of objections you might have to what I've said, but I've gone on a little bit too long. So I'm gonna call it here, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We'll follow the same procedure of I'll take names and there's lots of names already. And uh, so one, two, three, four, it will get us started. So John is up first. Okay, um, yeah, so Mark, that was a really, really great talk. I was captivated the entire time and I have so many questions. Please. Um, I will just ask one uh, and then I will bother you about this later today. Um, so I, I feel like there's a sort of order of what we want to explain here and we may end up just clashing on this. Uh, and I won't have a pretense, this is an objection. Um, so, you know, and I might ask the question, but it's an objection. Um, so you mentioned uh, the powers view briefly. I, I take it that neither one of us are super sympathetic to the counterfactual analysis type mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but you mentioned that, well, here's the problem with the powers view. I don't want to build in this sort of like modality, right? Just like at the very bottom. I feel like I want this to be explained, right? I don't want these like brute, um, well, you know, mass just exerts this force, right? Uh, so here is an alternative, um, I, I understand what he's saying, and it's by appeal to possible ones, right? So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna talk about um, 
this sort of like influencing as limiting the sorts of like possible worlds that come up, you know, and so on and so forth. But I then wonder, why can't I just reverse things, right? Because then I say, okay, well, we've got these possible worlds, but I want to know in virtue of what it is that I limit the future possible world. So I, I want to mix in this die, right? And what I've done is I've limited which future worlds will hold to the ones that are nomically consistent with what I've just done. But I want to know why that is, right? And the powers view, I think, gives me an answer to that, right? Because it's just built into what blue die is, right? That it can like have this sort of effect when mixed with anything else. Uh, you take a sort of like, you know, just agree with like John Heil and, and say like, well, you know, uh, you've got these dispositional partners and so on and so forth. Um, and I want to just say that in terms of powers, right? So I guess here's the, the question. What is more explanatorily advantageous when discussing this in terms of worlds rather than powers? Why is it not just like a sort of, well, it's just whichever way your gut goes, right? Like, mm. That's a good question. Um, let's see. I take it what you're asking at core is like, why would a, like a broadly speaking, kind of a, a humanism about modality be appealing as opposed to this kind of powers view in a nutshell? You know, for me at least, it does actually come down to some, I think, pretty gut intuitions. Um, I take it that the idea of building modality into the basic logical firmament leaves open some questions about like how we can explain modality um, that, you know, I, I would like to say more than just like, well, look, there's these powers, they exert influences, I can't explain that, I can't explain the kinds of possibilities that come out of that. Um, the sort of broadly human picture. So I, I guess I admit, I, I skew Lewisian on this stuff. I would be much more happy to say, look, that we have a mosaic or a pixel grid, if you like, of properties spread out across the world. And from there, uh, maybe the laws supervene on that. Actually, if you want to say the laws are basic, we can work with that too. Um, but that we get the way things work as a result of that broader distribution of properties Maybe that distribution of properties plus some, some laws down in there. But um, yeah, I, I'd much rather appeal to something like a combinatorial principle there to explain modality than just to start with it built in. I suspect that doesn't effectively really answer your question. In fact, I think we just may have a, a very gut difference in priorities and what kind of seems like. What is the simpler view, for example? Is it simpler to start with modality on the base and on the ground and then like build up from there or try to explain modality um, from some categorical properties? Yeah, no, I, I, you, I, I do think you answered my question because um, then like it, it turns out to be exactly that, a battle of the gut, of the gut intuitions, right? Because um, from the other side, I just see it as well. I want to explain what accounts for like this Sure. apparent mosaic and mm -hmm. i think that the thing that best accounts for that is some powers right so i yeah. think that the thing that makes it the case that you have all of these possibilities and that you can like you know when you mix this with that or it is some powers built mm -hmm. into this world and you know that's what makes sense of what's going to happen sure. next for sure. but yeah, yeah that, I, I don't want to take up any more time i'm thank you that's great let's go to rafa next well thanks for the talk it was, it was great um so it's more like a clarification question for us. Um, so, so take like an object uh, that's knife shaped. I think this. I think maybe Baker came up with this example. Maybe, uh, but I don't like. Um, so take an object that's knife shaped. Um, say that being knife shaped gives you. It makes it so that you're disposed to cut wood or whatever. Um, but then, uh, you that object also has the property of being made of butter. Um, so I guess I want to ask you, like, do you think that the property of being made of butter is masking uh, uh, the object's ability to chop wood, or if it's just no longer? Because my my gut's telling me that it just doesn't have that uh, disposition anymore. Sure, sure. Uh, so, so I guess my question is, do you think that that's a case of masking? Uh, if so, I think it's sounds impossible to me that that they would still have that disposition. 
um, because it's just a, a piece of butter that's shaped like a knife, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if not, uh, could, could you just clarify for my sake uh, why that's not a case of masking? Sure. Um, so I, I think that there's, Let me do one response and you let me know how it okay. how it says yeah. Um I don't think I'm obviously committed to just saying that something being knife shaped disposes it to cut. Right. To be disposed to cut, you might need to be knife shaped and also have some further property about like not being made of butter or being made of like sufficiently firm stuff. Um, and how that plays out will depend on what kind of influences we can ultimately attribute to knife shapedness by itself versus knife shapedness in conjunction with um, being made of steel or iron or who knows what. Um, and I guess I, I confess, I'm happy to say that if it turns out that merely being knife shaped really does on this model actually promote cutting um, adequately enough uh, or cutting when you know, moved in a certain way, right? Um, yeah, then I, I think it actually does have that disposition. I, I know it sounds, it sounds weird. Um, there, are, there are other cases like this for what it's worth. Um, so like uh, uh, one way example <laughs> of this is say like aluminum. Right, so aluminum actually shares the same basic microstructure with, with iron, such that the same basic microstructure that enables iron to rust when exposed to, exposed to moisture in the air. But aluminum doesn't rust when it's exposed, exposed to moisture in the air. Why not? Because aluminum has some other property that also disposes it to like develop a kind of, uh, what is it, like some kind of molecular behavior that sort of like, prevents oxidation, right? Um, a lot of people have the intuition that, no, 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 no. Like, aluminum is not disposed to rust. In fact, uh, somehow Troy makes a huge deal about this. He says, like as I said before, and I insist, we have an unshakable conviction that aluminum is not disposed to rust. Right? A philosophical account of dispositions must do justice to our intuitive understanding of them such that they approve of this conviction that aluminum is not disposed to rust, unless we are under forceful theoretical pressure to overturn it. I gotta confess, I admit it sounds weird to say that maybe the butter knife is disposed to cuts, and it sounds a little bit weird to say that aluminum is disposed to rust, in particular because those are just not useful things to say. Like, I think we can give a, a, a lot of very pragmatic reasons for why it would just not be useful to say that. But if what I've said is right here, I think we actually have a substantive theoretical reason to attribute those dispositions, right? Because if it's really true that things have these properties in virtue of which they exert an influence that sure looks dispositional, then why not just say, if we really wanna, when it comes down to it, they have these dispositions, they're just masked. It sounds a little unintuitive, but that's where the sort of like ground up metaphysics gets us. <coughs> Jerry? I'm thinking the possible world's theorists have a way of handling this problem, but when you talk about a suitable proportion of worlds, oh, well, yeah. it seems like there are ways that you could multiply worlds where there's a countervailing influence ad infinitum and non denumerably on tonight. You think of tiny variations of the thing that will oppose it. And for each tiny variation, you have a world. Is there a way of limiting this kind of proliferation where it still makes sense to say a suitable proportion? Yeah, that that's a real worry for sure. Um, so Tell you what, let me, um, I'll, again, I'll give you a response, see if you like it. Um, I'm taking this proportionality talk pretty much directly on board from Manley and Wasserman, but it, they're not the only ones to adopt it. So like Bob Venner appeals to something like this, Covered Bivolin also uses a kind of proportionality measure. I'm 
borrowing it from them. And I think we're going to sink or swim as a group, right? This is either going to work out or it won't. Um, and for what it's worth, you're, you're absolutely right. There's something really worrisome about this, right? The set of nominally possible worlds is infinite. And the set of nominally possible worlds in which any given event occurs is also infinite. And infinity is strange. And it looks like they have, they have the same cardinality, right? right yeah. um, in the same way, look, yeah, the, there are as many even numbers as there are natural numbers. Okay, the proportional like that. Right, and so the thought is this. Um, in order for this move to get off the ground of work, we have to have some way to make sense of talking about meaningful proportions of okay. sets of infinite things. And I think we all have this problem. Um, for what it's worth, Manley and Wasserman propose, they want, they want to suggest like, look, maybe there's some kind of way of working out a measure. No, um, I can see it. I mean, even with a non-denumerable set like the fractions between zero and one third, there's one third as many of those as there is between two thirds and one in a sense. You know? yeah, yeah. So in that sense, okay. We, we have to appeal to oh, something okay. like that. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Sin. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. I um, have a question. I, I'm not actually sure what um, is meant by it masking because oh, sure. is the idea just that it didn't mean all like you know we all like these dispositions are always they're not always manifesting right? sure. so like i have sure. tons of different dispositions but they're not always manifesting they only manifest in certain conditions or whatever right because like even the first example you have about a plant's disposition to dry out in the sun and mass by watering it. Like that seems really weird to me. It's because it seems like plants have a disposition to also to grow, to, you know, like turn green in the sun and like to take in water and like, you know, put use water in its like biological processes or whatever, right? Like, and so the fact that the the plant is drying out is not really masked by water. The water is more like a the condition, like it's a manifesting condition, right? So if it's the conditions are dry, the plant's disposition is to dry out. If the conditions are wet, the plant's dis um, disposition is to like, I don't know, grow and be leafy. I don't know, um, be green. And uh, so it just seems like adding water is not really masking any disposition it's more just like i don't know it's just presenting the conditions right it's just what the sure. conditions are i mean the same thing with the with the example of ned right so ned's just is disposed to ramble when he's nervous but he also has this capacity right to be resolved i don't know how so disposed to be like follow his will or something i don't know like how you work that, but something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, so his resolve, right, is um, not, I don't know, I wouldn't say it's masking his disposition to ramble. It's more like that's the disposition that is like manifested at that time, right? Because what I'm kind of confused by is how, sorry, this is kind of a long question, is how the end of your talk hooks up with this talk of masking, right? Because the end, you talk a lot about having like opposing dispositions. And that seems much more descriptive of what's happening when you have these masking cases, right? That there is these opposing mm -hmm. op dispositions of like objects, right? So the plants have, have the disposition to dry out. It also has the disposition to get green and leafy. And it's kind of, I mean, those aren't like, one isn't masked by the other it's just sort of which disposition is like manifest at a time um so like ned could have the disposition to be like resolved or disposition to be nervous and it's just given the condition that he is or like given you know like one manifests over the other so it's not one isn't masking the other i don't know like that just seems like a weird way to talk yeah i don't know does that make sense yeah i, th yeah. I think it does so yeah. um so uh, first of all i think like may i culpa if i did not actually define masks and just glossed over that that is my fault hopefully that's on this that's actually on the handout but like here, here's what a mask is um a mask is a kind of safeguard a so a safeguard in the following sense 
Um, a mask is something that would prevent a disposition from manifesting in the face of its stimulus. And it would do that without removing the disposition. Right? So the thought is something like this. Um, take the fragile vase. The fragile vase is disposed to break when struck. You wrap that in bubble wrap. You can now strike it, and it wouldn't break. But it's still fragile, right? So the bubble wrap is a kind of safeguard against breaking in the face of striking. So that's what a, a mask is, right? And so uh, if there's no disposition there, there's no mask, right? There might be something that might stop something from acting in a way, but to understand some kind of safeguard as a mask is to suppose that there is some disposition there in the first place to oppose and to prevent from that. So um, if you want to say that plants aren't actually disposed to dry out in the sun, then watering wouldn't be a mess. But then there's also then no problem for, say, like the simple conditional account, which is an account of dispositions. So like, you know, masks were generally like, masks entered the, the literature on dispositions specifically as counterexamples to the simple conditional account of dispositions. Right. So, okay. So, yeah. So I followed that bit so far. Right? I think it's the bit that I'm getting stuck on is this intrinsic versus extrinsic masking thing, sure. right? Because look, if, if there's an extrinsic mask, right, where I'm actively like blocking the, you know, like wrapping the base and bubble wrap, right? Like, so that I can like I can understand what's going on there, but I'm kind of getting confused, I guess, by these intrinsic cases, right? Sure. Because it seems like if it's intrinsic, how is it masking? It aren't you just isn't there? Aren't you just revealing another disposition? You know, like which I think is actually like what you're saying towards the end. I don't know, <laughs> like, uh, like, uh, but I mean, like this plant. I mean, I, maybe I'm just getting tripped up by the plant example at the very beginning because I'm just like I really just don't feel like adding or subtracting water is like masking dispositions of plants. If it's like adding or subtracting water is C, it's condition C. Sorry, <laughs> like you know, so it's not. Um, anyways. That's just my, my like the if it's intrinsic, how is it masking? Is like the question, I guess. Yeah. Sure. Well, it would it would be here's, here's like a, just a quick technical answer. It would be masking if you have an intrinsic property such that you are disposed, or rather you have some intrinsic disposition, and you have some other property that prevents that disposition from manifesting when this characteristic stimulus condition is obtained. Right. So if the, if the disposition is a disposition to ramble when nervous, the characteristic stimulus conditions there are nervousness and the manifestation is rambling. So on say the simple conditional account, that means that Ned is, if he's disposed to ramble when nervous, he would ramble if he was nervous. An intrinsic mask then would be some other property that Ned has such that when he's nervous, this property prevents him from rambling. So I want to I want to get in. Uh, we're going to interrupt their line and jump to a student question. Brief. Yeah, uh, kind of playing off of what Dr. Dang just said. So it seems like, in a sense, wouldn't an intrinsic mask over time just become its own disposition? Sure, uh, intrinsic masks can be dispositions, right? So in the case of these opposing dispositions, you you would potentially have one disposition masking the other. Right. So, for example, um, there, there's a, a case like this on the, the bottom of the handout. So, like, it's suppose that we have a. Uh, da, 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 da. So, let's say we have endorse a kind of dispositional account of desire, right? To be desire that P is to be disposed to try that P or something like that. So, you can imagine someone who is disposed, who desires to um, be with their family on their next vacation. And you can imagine that that same person also has like a very conflicting desire. They also wanna be very far away from their family on their next vacation. Well, they, they can't do both of those things, but there's a sense which they have these two now competing dispositions. And both of those, if you wanna look at the conditionals then, they, they can't both turn out to be true. You can't be both really trying to be with your family and also trying to not be with your family. So 
one of those dispositions is going to manifest on the next vacation at most. In that case, if we have two dispositions, one of those dispositions will be masking the other. But they will also be opposing dispositions, right? They are dispositions that are pulling someone in these two different directions. And, and for what it's worth, I, I think that it's actually more helpful to talk about like opposing dispositions and resisting dispositions than just masking dispositions, right? If you want to take just even the, the simple like wine glass fragility example, uh, here's two ways to mask that wine glass's fragility. You can cover it completely with your bubble wrap. Or under certain cases, you could just as effectively mask the wine glass's fragility by like taping a single like a styrofoam peanut to one part of it that, as it happens, is right where it would have been impacted. It's so false that it would break if impacted, but you've only like done a tiny little thing. That little thing is a mask, but it's not really resisting this disposition to break when struck to the same degree that that like full on careful packing job is going to do. All right. So once we can talk about like this, these, this more general sense of resisting or opposing disposition. I think it's also ultimately, you know, more meaningful in many cases. Um, but if we're going to still try to talk about masking itself, um, the mask is just a, a would-be preventer. Robert. Uh, yeah. So um, I am going to uphold philosophical tradition and ask a question that is actually an objection. <laughs> uh, but possibly it follows from just not understanding the view correctly. Sure. Uh, so I'll allow for that. Um, so I'm worried that uh, it's not just unfortunate Ned who has an intrinsically masked disposition to ramble when he's nervous uh, on this view, but like all of us do. Um, so like, uh, if you took me and you subtracted out the event that is that I have social awareness or whatever, I would ramble when I was nervous too. So there's some remaining event corresponding to my having whatever other systems are involved in like understanding and language production and everything, sure. uh, which looks like on this picture is fighting my social self-awareness. Mm -hmm. And I therefore have an intrinsically masked disposition to ramble when I'm nervous. And I'm worried that just I have an intrinsically masked disposition to do almost anything because you can find some event corresponding to some feature I have such that if you subtracted exactly all these 17 other things out, I would be doing this and that. Uh, and it's, so it seems like uh, part of the motivation was to explain something that was like different between me and Ned, but actually we're all just gonna have like billions of mass <laughs> intrinsic dispositions to do whatever. Sure, 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 sure. I like that. Um, let's see, what can we say here? Um, so let, let me just make sure I have the objection correct. So the thought is that like, look, Ned has some property such that when he has that property, it sort of, it influences him towards rambling when he's nervous. And the thought is that like, look, uh, we all have those properties that dispose us towards rambling when we're nervous. It's just that we have a bunch of other properties that resist that, that push in ways that Ned doesn't. Right, or perhaps that what Ned has is actually like just a much stronger push. I feel like even interpreting it pushes is something that I'm already a little skeptical of. I was just interpreting it purely counterfactually. Yeah. You know, that like there's this event that is me having this property. And if you subtracted out the other one, sure. then the set of gnomically possible worlds consistent with that would be mostly ramble worlds. Sure, sure, sure. Um, So I, I think one thing we can we can say here um, one thing this proportionality view lets us sort of appeal to is, is to talk about the strength of various dispositions, and particularly we want to say that to have a disposition is to say manifest um, is to promote a certain outcome in a suitable proportion of worlds. Um, a lot of the times when we talk about, we use sort of like dispositional language, th there's often a sort of like implicitly comparative element. Like lots of things break when struck. Fragile things do so more easily, right? Um, our standards of what might count as rambling when nervous, I think can be cued to as a kind of comparative measure as well, right? So, it could very well be the case that Ned 
has this, this, that maybe we all have some property that does lean or incline us towards rambling when we're nervous, but that doesn't necessarily count as having a suitable, you don't have necessarily have a suitable proportion. We have some proportion, but it's not necessarily a suitable proportion, right? So the thought is that we have to have a disposition, it has to be, it has to promote a certain outcome with a certain amount of force. You can promote that outcome with less force and not have that disposition, but still promote it. Right. So one thing, one way to try and I think start to speak to this, I think is maybe what we want to say is something like that. Does that I have I, follow ups that I feel like <laughs> we're so, so yeah. Uh, I have a disposition to let us yeah. go on forever because I love this stuff, but I'm gonna mask that disposition <laughs> and bring us to an end and have us thank our speaker and thank you all for coming today.